You're watching Zoo Tours, the channel that takes you on a virtual field trip to the zoo. The weather is finally nice. The zoo blooms are a bloomin', and it feels so good to be back home. Welcome back for yet another tour of the world famous Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden. Our last visit was all about spineless critters of the award-winning world of the insect, what some call objectively the zoo's best exhibit. But today I want to show you something that I think is even better. The Cincinnati Zoo is famous for its old history, but the Manatee Springs is not part of that. But not many know that the building was actually a standard aquarium for nearly 50 years. But after a fire destroyed the progress of the aquarium's renovation, the zoo took the marine life theme to a whole nother level in 1999. While the manatee name is at the front of the building, this was all designed as a celebration of Florida's biodiversity with over 20 other species, promoting long-term conservation of the state's ecosystem by integrating naturalistic animal habitats with museum-style exhibits. Before we begin, if this is your first time watching, please consider liking, subbing, and hitting that bell icon so you can be first in line for your tours. After you get your fair share of Cincinnati chili from the newer Mai Tais market, that beautiful, iconic glass building appears over the hill. And it's a personal tradition of mine to always stop and admire that entrance, which looks even better and more magical during the Christmas celebration. I always also stop and look at this manatee sculpture, which I thought was an original piece, but turns out you can actually find one at Zoo Tampa's entrance as well. But that doesn't make this one any less special. The main building did open in 1950, but the glass section, or the greenhouse, was added into the 1999 reimagination. As soon as those doors slide open, you're enclosed in a thick blanket of humidity. The heat, the live native plants that reach the 35 foot tall ceiling, the free roaming animals, and even the sweat are all a necessary part of the immersion. If you've never been to Florida, this is what it feels like. For many years, lizards and birds shared your space, but in my 20 something years, I never saw anything. They were recently replaced with a few more birds, but I've only been able to catch their silhouettes. However, I have never failed to find our first animal, no matter how stealthy and good they are at hiding. Manatees are a must-see species, but when it comes to Florida, it doesn't really get much more iconic than the American alligator. This is Lucy, who's apparently been at the zoo since 1998. And according to this, she wasn't always alone. Now, if you're wondering why her eye is shooting bubbles, well, that's just air escaping from their sinuses. Their nasal cavities run behind their eyes, and when their nostrils are closed underwater, it's kind of like as if they're exhaling out of their eyes, and it's thought to help keep them submerged underwater. Lucy is the building's first species, but also one of the most overlooked animals at the zoo. Her habitat does give her a lot of privacy, and it's not your typical American alligator build. It represents a gator hole. In the wild, they might not really have much access to water in the winter and the spring dry season, so they'll take a small body of water and dig with their tail, claws, and snout until it's a deeper pool of water, or in this case, 5,500 gallons. So not only would they have somewhere to soak year-round, but it gives other species a place to drink and take refuge. Her display also mentions just how great they are at parenting. That's for another time if we do ever see any tiny chompers. The middle of the greenhouse has a small but what used to be a very entertaining bridge. It sits on top of a small pond. It opened with a Florida gar, then turtles, then an alligator snapping turtle, then mosquito fish, then more turtles, and now nothing. But that's okay. That just means there's less of a traffic jam to get to a zoo tourist first that's also overlooked. Not because visitors think that there's nothing in here, because Leslie is just that hard to find. And I'll give you one more shot. You are looking for an American crocodile. Alligator is such a household name to the southeastern United States. 
But not that many people know the country is also home to a crocodile. But that doesn't stop visitors from calling her an alligator. Gators are darker, have broader, rounded snouts. The American crocodile is grayish green with a narrow triangular snout, and they're not too far different in size. Boys or bulls average 15 feet, the girls or cows are 9 feet. When you're going up against the gator, they will always lose the popularity contest in the states. Only a couple thousand live in the southernmost tip of Florida, versus one million gators across the southeast. They are considered a very rare species in the US, at the same time are the most widespread of the four kinds of crocodiles from the Americas, so they're also found in the Caribbean, Mexico, and northern parts of South America. If 100% humidity and realistic Florida weather is not for you, no one would judge you but me if you just skimmed through the greenhouse. As soon as that door slides open, you're hit with the sweet, serene feeling of air conditioning. The darkened guest path allows you to make a better search in an equally dark tank, past all the bluegill and the crap, and no, I'm not making a joke, is an alligator snapping turtle. Another prehistoric looking creature that can live long enough to be considered an antique. They can live well over 100 years old, and when they're fully grown, they're one of the largest turtles that you probably don't want to be face to face with. Cincinnati's last snapper was 160 pounds, and that's not even as big as they can get. I know you really don't have much of a reference to their size, but whoever this may be, it's either Dale or Grace, is actually kind of on the small side. This one was born in the late 90s, I think, so they still have a lot of growing to do. The smallest area, which is air conditioned, don't worry, is the River of Grass. These two displays always contained species that refuge in the tall, swampy grass. What last hosted a night anole lizard features the green basilisk, named after a mythological monster that could turn people into stone with their gaze. That might not be true for this kind of basilisk, but they do have a special trick, a miracle you might say. They can sprint away from danger by running along the surface of the water. Even though they are in the river of grass, they actually prefer to live in trees and use water or grasses to escape predators. And even though they're in a Florida exhibit, they are native to Central America. However, they are not entirely out of place. The common basilisk, also native to Central and South America, has been introduced to Florida and is considered an invasive species, which we'll actually talk about more in a bit. The unit next door had an orb weaver spider green tree frogs, South American milky frogs, but recently put on display was one eastern indigo snake. You might not be able to tell here, but you're looking at the longest native snake in North America, reaching 7 to 9 feet long. And you might be asking, what's wrong with their eye? Well, I'm not the snake's vet, but as far as I know, they're okay. It's just one of the many indications that they are about to shed their skin. Now is the moment you've all been waiting for, one of the superstars of the zoo world, Snooplog the Alligator Gar. Now talk about a river monster, but despite their reputation, they actually are not a threat to humans. 8 to 10 feet long, 200 to 300 pounds, with 80 sharp teeth. Much like an alligator, they are a living fossil, as they really haven't evolved too much over 100 million years making Snoop a very fitting addition to this living museum. Oh yeah, and I almost forgot, his best friends are manatees. Manatees are Cyrenians, the only herbivorous group of marine mammals. They evolved 50 million years ago, from a common ancestor that's also related to some of the most unlikely creatures, hyraxes and elephants. Together, they are a super order of subungulates. Now, ungulates are animals with hooves, like giraffes, antelope, and deer. Elephants, hyraxes, and sirenians are what's called almost having hoofed creatures. And if you find that hard to believe, just take a look at their forelimbs. At the very tip, they have what looks like fingernails, like an elephant's foot. Just one of the ways that shows they evolved from land animals. Cincinnati is only one of two facilities in the country that publicly displays the Florida manatee outside of Florida. 
they participate in a partnership that rehabs ill, injured, and orphaned sea cows that were mostly rescued by SeaWorld. I really wish I could introduce you to them all, but you're actually looking at three different generations that have stopped by over the last few years. At the viewing area, if you were to look up, each one has their own bio with their name, age, and how much they eat. And during the Christmas time, they even get their own stocking. Since 1999, the Cincinnati Zoo has cared for 26 manatees, and 19 have been successfully released back into the wild. The other facility outside of Florida is about two hours north of here, except theirs is a saltwater display, while this is freshwater. This tank is 120,000 gallons and has 38 feet worth of viewing glass. I've seen nearly every single manatee exhibit in America. This is the only one that doesn't let you see above the surface. But the other places can't say that they allow their visitors to see manatees through a bubble. It's six and a half feet in diameter and brings you two and a half feet into the tank. It's also one of the best family photo spots at the zoo. And to the kids, it's an attraction on its own. Every manatee facility that I've seen is unique in some way, but they really lacked any sort of connection. No matter what sea cow rolls through the Queen City, most of the time they're checking out the crowd and get so close to you that you can count the whiskers on their face. And even if you've seen this a hundred times, moments like these never get old, especially if you've earned your honorary boop. If you don't happen to see them, they might just be behind the scenes where they get medical checkups and sometimes grab a snack. If that is the case, just look to the right of the bubble. There's a TV with a live feed of the behind the scenes pool. Even if you don't find them there, check out the zoo's social media because there's a chance that the sea cows were successfully released and the zoo is just waiting to help other manatees in need. While you're waiting to get your own personal boops, the viewing is actually pretty entertaining too. There are sculptures both on the ground and hanging from the ceiling, including a manatee followed by one of its greatest threats. There's actual warning signs that you will find in Florida's canals and shores. And while you're watching the manatees, you can sit back and relax on a pile of manatees. Now, how cool is that? What's even cooler is that you can sign your kid up to have a slumber party with the manatees for the Sleep with the Manatee program. And if you're interested, there is a link to that in the comments. Right now, you're probably about to click on another video, but according to the species list, we are only about halfway done. This is the Alien Invaders Tank, once full of Florida's known invasive aquatic life and plants. It made a lot more sense when it had a basilisk, tilapia, and piranhas, but now the main attractions are gars and common cooter turtles, which are in fact native to Florida. At least it's still lively with a bunch of African cichlids. The main idea of the tank is to educate you why invasive species are a big problem. They use up resources that native species should be using, and they can modify ecosystems by spreading diseases, and if it's possible, hybridizing with the native wildlife, which can lead to some animals to become functionally extinct. This section teaches the importance of biodiversity. Because Florida supports both temperate and tropical zones, as you already saw, the state is home to a wide range of usual and some very unusual wildlife. The Apalachicola king snake. It might look like your average snake, and their royal name doesn't actually have to do with their size. King snakes in general will eat amphibians and rodents, but they get their name because they hunt other snakes some of which are venomous, and what makes their diet even more impressive is that they are non-venomous themselves. Diving right back into the aquatics is the Greater Siren. Now that doesn't mean you're going to hear this animal shout like an alarm system or an ambulance. Their scientific name combines Greek and Latin words that pertains to lizards and mermaids. I really wish that were the case but sirens are eel-like amphibians. For those of you familiar with axolotls, because who isn't, it kind of looks like you just took one and stretched it out about another foot. Like the axolotl, they have lungs and external gills, so they can breathe underwater, and sirens have been known to take gulps from the air at the surface. They also have a flattened tail, but the only thing that this salamander is missing 
are hind legs, very much like a mermaid. If you thought that was an animal oddity, just wait until you see the two-toed Amphiuma, another salamander. They're still considered fully aquatic, but will come out of the water if it's raining and females will lay eggs on land. Like most salamanders, they do have four limbs, two in the front and two in the way back. If you couldn't guess, they are borderline useless, and I really can't help but laugh every time I see them. What's not a laughing matter though, is what's underneath that serenading smile. They have razor sharp teeth, so they can catch frogs, crayfish, and even other salamanders. And yes, I've read plenty of stories that say that their bite can be very painful. The second half of the Florida biodiversity section has even more than the first, and it kicks off with another zoo tours first. This is the gray rat snake. So I'm pretty sure every one of you has seen a snake do this with their tongue. And no, they're not mocking us. What they're actually doing is sort of collecting information and getting a better sense of their surroundings. Their tongue does not have any taste buds, but it can still gather chemicals in the air and send them to a sensory organ that's just above the roof of their mouth. So essentially in a way, they are able to smell with their tongue. The most abundant venomous snake in Florida is the dusky pygmy rattlesnake. How pygmy are we talking? Well, their max length is two feet, which sounds pretty long from what you're looking at, but they can coil so tight to fit in the palm of your hand and still have plenty of room. And they only have a few rattles, but they are so small, the rattling sound has been compared to the buzzing from a tiny insect. Where the siren used to be now contains American flagfish, who I did not see. Now, if you think the manatees are the stars of Manatee Springs, you might want to rethink that because I know a few regulars who would argue that it's actually the world's friendliest loggerhead musk turtle. Very friendly looking indeed, but there's a few reasons why some call them a stink pot. The species, not this individual. When they're threatened, they'll secrete an unpleasant smelling and tasting liquid from the base of their tail in hopes to keep predators away by telling them that I taste absolutely awful. The final corner is the building's discovery center, one of the most educational setups in the zoo, and it really shows what I mean when I say that Manatee Springs is also a museum. On the very far left is a step-by-step -step breakdown on what it takes to save a manatee. From its rescue, the first step, rehabilitation, which is the second, all the way to the release. You can see living manatees right in front of your very eyes, but they're also complemented by one of the best displays a zoo has ever put together. A 360 degree view of a full size replica skeleton of a manatee. One of the signs mentions every one of their unique anatomical features and even talks about their closest relatives. In this way, it lets you see that manatees on the inside have hands that are very similar to ours. Facing the skeleton, there's a few objects that are encased in the glass. Some parts on the top panel are magnified, so you can get a closer view of a bone that's part of their hearing system, their lower jaw, and their conveyor belt teeth. And lastly, a single rib bone. This display case on the very right boasted their AZA exhibit award and collection of taxidermied creatures and even more bones. But in the weeks that I filmed, these were replaced with art and ecosystems, sustainable sculptures where artists took trash that was most likely litter and turned them into art. I will miss the other models, but this definitely does have a greater message. At least you're still able to compare the anatomy of three groups of crocodilians, alligators, gharials, and crocodiles. And the zoo did leave the people of Florida case untouched and you can still marvel at their hunting tools, masks, baskets, several other colorful artifacts, and even their history. The space behind the counter is reserved for keepers and docents. Throughout the busy months and the Festival of Lights, the keeper will usually bring out a snake to the crowd. Sometimes it's a ball python, but last time I saw a beautiful Brazilian rainbow boa named Argo. And yes, if you ask, you are free to pet them. The last living exhibit is a can't miss because it may just be the thing you remember most about this building, the Palmetto Scrub. 
For nearly two decades, it had eastern diamondback rattlesnakes, and in fact, the information signs about the facts and myths of rattlesnakes is still hanging up. We just saw North America's longest native snake, now living beneath this beautiful mural. You get to look for, I guess you could say, America's largest snake in general, the Burmese python. One of the largest snakes in the world, actually. A 215 pound, 18 footer was found in Florida in 2022. Now here's a fun twist. They're native to the tropical regions of East and Southeast Asia. So what is an Asian species doing in a Florida exhibit? This is not the case of a zoo substituting one species to represent something else. Burmese pythons are perhaps the most famous invasive species in Florida. Thousands were imported in the 70s and 80s to be sold as exotic pets. People couldn't handle having such a giant snake in their home, so they illegally released them into the wild. No one actually knows the exact population. Some will say that there's tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and even one million in Florida. Cincinnati has had a Burmese on display for as long as I've been around. Once in the reptile house, where a king cobra now lives, then they were moved to the Night Hunters, where you can find armadillos. Then finally they were moved to Manatee Springs. Right now you will find two that are very easy to tell apart. The larger one is a female named Nagini, named after Voldemort's snake. The smaller male is Leaf. They're not just different in size, but also clearly in pattern. At first I thought it was because he was much younger, but it's actually the result of a genetic mutation or a morph. There's a bunch of different kinds, from albino, lavender, and even green. But I found out the other day that Leaf has a granite morph. The last thing you might come across is this large wall of photographs that paints a wild picture of Florida's plants and animals, most of which are not exhibited in Manatee Springs. Or maybe the last thing you'll read behind this penny press are educational signs on Florida's future. While manatees alone are a major symbol of conservation in Manatee Springs, this preserved Florida scrub jay and the dusky seaside sparrow really should be just as impactful. Because the human population down there is growing, there's more development, more agriculture, and with their habitats being destroyed, the Florida scrub jay is critically endangered while the dusky sparrow went extinct. The zoo says that conservation is much too important to be left to the experts. Every one of us has a responsibility to help preserve biodiversity. One of their signs suggests maybe slowing down in no wake zones. Never ever pour toxins down the drain as they could find their way to natural waterways. Oh, and try not to litter because your actions might even affect an ecosystem that's hundreds of miles away from you. Now you'd think that would be all for today, but I was reminded to mention a small look at the zoo's past, at an exhibit next door that's no longer in use. In 1975, the Big Cat Canyon opened on this small hillside with three white tigers. In 1998, the white tigers were moved to the Tiger Canyon, and the famous duo Siegfried and Roy gifted the zoo with white lions who lived right here. A few years later, Three males and one female were born. The males went to Toledo, while the girl Gracious stayed in Cincinnati with the rest of the pride. But naturally, as time went on, all four of the zoo's white lions passed on. The very last to survive was Gracious, who lived for nearly 21 years. While the zoo never had nor will they ever have any plans to obtain new white lions, the pride of the millennium, as Siegfried and Roy called them, will always be remembered in this city. The exhibit was temporarily home to Bennett's Wallabies, but now it sits empty once more and will most likely be demolished to make way for the footpath to the zoo's future elephant trek. And that sea bulls and sea cows will conclude the latest tour of the Cincinnati Zoo and Botanical Garden. If you've made it this far, I want to thank you for joining me on this very extensive journey through the award-winning Manatee Springs, arguably the greatest project in Cincinnati to date, and so far, the greatest celebration of Florida's wildlife I have ever been a part of. Even greater than Florida-focused exhibits I've actually seen in Florida. So until next time, please stay tuned, stay wild, and don't forget your boops, and thank you for watching Zoo Tours.